Welcome to the contributors track of Backstage Community Sessions, April edition. Um, today in the agenda, we have quite a few few demos. So I'll keep the keep the videos and everything short. Um, we have Taras from Frontside um, who will demo a new GraphQL plugin, something that uh, that's been talked about a lot in the backstage world. Uh, so quite curious about that. We have folks from American Airlines, and they are going to demo an Argo CD plugin. Um, are you around? Please uh, leave um, your name in the chat so that I can make you co-host um, so that you have uh, screen share permissions. Um, we have Tim um, talking about notifications inside Backstage. Yay. We have Otto um, talking about Tech Docs add-ons, I believe. I'll let um, Otto do the demo. But first, um, I would like to do some conversation, and this is my favorite part of Contributors Track, with a Spotlight nomination. This time, um, we have Patrick um, Jungerman, I'm sorry if the name is not right, from Berlin. Are you around, Patrick? Feel free to unmute yourself so that I can. Yes, I'm here. Hey, good to see you. Uh, tell us a bit about yourself, um, where you're from, and how you got into the backstage world. Um, yeah, I'm from Berlin, also born here, um, working for Bonial. Uh, uh, we do online advertisement for um, retail business, and um, I'm principal um, engineer here at Bonial. Work here since, yeah, I don't know, 13 something years. And um, yeah, we started backstage um, or to explore backstage uh, with the need of, of something like a service catalog. Um, previously, we already um, set up something like a API catalog and so on, more something homegrown. Uh, homegrown. And um, yeah, also with the need to get a bit more um, overview about um, the ownership of certain um, software components. Um, of course, we do have something also for deployed artifacts, but um, that uh, was not enough for our needs. And um, we also wanted to have certain analytics um, based on that data then um, thinking about uh, yeah, stuff like bus factor or um, analyzing legacy systems a bit more in detail um, to make decisions on uh, when to act and so on. Um, yeah, that's great. Backstage um, has some some more features which were interesting then as well for other projects. Um, so kind of multiple things came together. Uh, mm -hmm. Software uh, templates, for example, was also very interesting. Yeah, and how was it? How was your experience jumping into the project? I'm I'm thinking more in terms of contributing um, over adoption. Um, so like, how did you find the community? When, when you started contributing, how did you like the whole process, et cetera? Do you have any experiences to share? Um, worked quite smoothly, I would say. Uh, I, I yeah, tried to solve some, some things um, I, I noticed for, for our stack. That's how, how it started, basically, and um, joined the Discord um, and, um, yeah got help myself first, and then um, started with some smaller changes to, to get going. Um, especially, like, I think in the beginning, I started with something like uh, MS Graph, like in uh, some smaller changes uh, to make uh, the filtering easier and so on. So basically, you start up, uh, start with the importing your org data and so on, right? And then uh, I just uh, tried to improve it a bit for us and um, then got further and further. <laughs> That's good. Um, and what's on your roadmap for for backstage? What what do you uh, let's say would you like to see next um, in backstage? I think a very uh, much desired uh, functionality is event based updates. Uh, already had some chat with some some people here. <laughs> Yeah, I um, think that's the one thing that gets discussed in all community <laughs> sessions. Yes, uh, for sure. 
Um, yeah, especially due to uh, things like um, rate limits and so on from third party providers. It's sometimes a bit uh, complicated uh, to circumvent that, but um, yeah, I think that's uh, at the moment uh, probably the, the most desired functionality. Um, we're still exploring some of the other things, um, like getting a bit more into uh, software templates, uh, looking into tech insights, and um, so, yeah, I think we uh, still need to learn a bit more about some parts to make uh, to make a better statement here. Awesome. And last thing from me, uh, do you have any tips for a new contributor trying to uh, make a contribution to Backstage? Do you have any tips, uh, advices? Anything? Just get started. <laughs> to be honest. Get started. I think it's, yeah. it's, not, it's not so complicated. Um, of course, in the beginning, it's, it's always looks like that. And uh, something small makes sense. Um, that's also what, what I did, like uh, take a small change first. Uh, and that will also take some time. I mean, from, for me, for example, I. I wasn't really used to type TypeScript. Uh, it wasn't something I, I used to work with. Um, so mm -hmm. I had to of course get into how, how does a project structure looks like and so on. And eventually you just get more used to this. And also what is a, how does this um, whole project work, right? And uh, yeah. And start with something you, you need yourself. I think that helps for motivation. <laughs> Yeah. One tricky thing that comes in contributions is that if you don't have backstage inside your company, let's say you're, you're a student at, at a college somewhere and you're looking to contribute to backstage, it, it feels weird because you're never going to adopt it for yourself or for your personal projects. Um, but if you already like work, work at a company using backstage, I think that should um, get a bit easier. Yes, yes, exactly. I guess in a company environment or corporate environment, you usually have then the other side, like uh, how, how does it work internally with sharing your, your code or contributing back and so on. Um, uh, I myself prefer to, to rather contribute it back and have it in the main lines and having something patched and uh, yeah, getting out of hand at some point. Um, so I think it's, it's, especially with things which were already there, it's, it's easy to have it contributed back and um, send for everyone. Well, um, so good to talk to you, Patrick, and uh, thank you for joining and see you around in community. Thank you. Bye. So that was Patrick. Um, next up, I would like to invite um, Carl from American Airlines. Are you, um, are you around? Maybe not. Um, so American Airlines folks, if you're around for the Argo CD plugin demo, um, reach out to me or paste um, in the chat, but let's move on then. Uh, next up is, um, I would like to invite Tim to talk more about notifications API RFC. Yeah, hey Manchu. Uh, I'll paste a link in the chat here. We've opened a RFC for notifications in Backstage, which is something that was requested originally in ticket number 639, which tells you how long ago this was requested, because we're now over 10,000, 11,000 in the tickets. Uh, so this is kind of a humble RFC that looks to implement something just in the front end. So a proper notification system we think would have a back end and a front end. Uh, so we're trying to start small and just kind of scope something out such that plugins have a way to send notifications to users or to the system at large. So some examples where this might be handy is suppose you have a build failure, you want to alert the owners that the build failed, or if you have a data pipeline failure or a security incident or you know, just a pager duty incident. Those are examples of things you want might want to send a notification about. And it's kind of uh, what you might expect 
you know, there's like a little bell icon in the sidebar that'll show a little dot if you have things that are need your attention. Um, so there's a lot to it. Uh, we want comments on the RFC about use cases and feedback on our proposal. It's kind of a changed quite a bit already since the initial post. So I'd say if this is something that interests you, make sure to read through the comments because the ideas are already shifting quite a bit. We're thinking that uh, eventually there's going to be some kind of event stream for Backstage, which has already been proposed for the catalog. They, uh, you can subscribe to certain events and then in turn, those might trigger notifications. So you can have events about a build happening and maybe it doesn't trigger a notification unless it fails, but you can go see those events on a component page, for example, where you can react to those events in your own plugins and trigger things off. Uh, so it's, it's stretching a little bit, maybe beyond notifications, but we wanted to think through and make sure that we're designing for the way that it eventually will be. So definitely looking for comments on there. It's pinned to the top of the issues if you missed the link, but uh, yeah, have a look. Let us know what you think. Open for feedback most important RFC open as of this moment. Um, Tim, if I, if I may ask, what, what do you think would be like the most complicated thing um, while implementing this? What, what are some challenges that you see? Yeah, something we're struggling with right now is that notifications in the way we think about them uh, need front end knowledge. So for example, you wanna route someone to a build page if their build fails, but the front end is the only thing that knows about routing. And you might want to have some interactive elements like on a notification, you might want to say re-trigger build, which is an action rather than just a link. So if you have these things that are front end only, then it's hard to store those notifications anywhere in the back end in a way that makes sense because you might have react elements or something attached to them. So how do you kind of replay those notifications. If I go to a notification page and I want to see all the notifications that have happened in the past that have already been delivered, how do I sort of rehydrate those from the events that happened? So we're trying to figure that out uh, as well as, you know, just the format of notifications. We want to offer flexibility plus ease, which is always a hard thing to combine. You want to be able to create notifications without much effort, but if you really want to go deep and customize them, you should be able to do that. So trying to achieve that balance, I think is, is tough. It's going to be really exciting. Um, hope to see notifications live and as well as a wall and a timeline. Uh, let's see what, what's more to come inside <laughs> backstage. I was just kidding. Um, but like buttons. Like <laughs> this already a favorite uh, components. So thank you, Tim, for explaining the RFC. It's still open. Uh, the link is in the chat. I'm going to paste again here and feel free to express your opinions. Thank you, Tim. So next up, um, I would like to invite Otto uh, to talk a bit about uh, TikToks. Are you around, Otto? Yes, I am. Hello. Hey. I have this little presentation. If it works, do you see my full screen? Oh, it's loading. Just a second. Now it says it's loading. Now it's, yes, it's here. Does it look like it should be looking? Yes. Perfect. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, as announced earlier, I will talk about the, the TechDocs add-on framework. Uh, if anyone has heard of that before, probably it was, uh, there was an RFC in the open and we've mentioned it on some occasions before. But this is like more a summary of everything. So a bit about me, uh, I'm on a team called Pulp Fiction, which mainly deals with TechDocs and search, both at Spotify, but also in the open in parallel. And um, yeah, so I want to present what we've done in the team since the last month, especially around the add-ons. So TechDocs add-on, what? I mean, 
what framework, what add-ons, what, what is this? Like? So um, it is an addition, uh, addition to Tech Docs in a way that we allow, we create a framework to extend the functionality of Tech, Doc, Tech Docs by certain front end uh, functionalities. I will go a bit more into detail, but that's the in a nutshell. So Tech Docs can be pluggable in the future. So here we have Tech Docs page, a very simple example. It is generated from your markdown files that they put to the code, and it generates this neat little site for you, uh, all from markdown. But it does a bit more than that. It's not just you know the heading and some image or some text and lists and paragraphs. It does also allow you to have a little Chrome around it. So you have the header, you have on the left, you have a table of contents, uh, on the right, on the left, you have a navigation. So there's some little extras we already do out of the box and on the bottom like the left and right um, navigation. But there was many cases where we thought, okay, maybe there's even more things you want to do, not just like a simple read experience, but what about if you want to show how many issues are in our repository or on a bigger picture, we don't only want to read documentation, we also want to make sure the documentation quality and the culture behind it is iterating, it's emphasizing, it's growing and improving constantly. So we were thinking, okay, we, we need more, like we need interactive stuff, we need to display things, we know, maybe want to embed something, maybe we want to have the content even more versatile. So we thought, okay, there needs to be something. We want to provide a framework that anyone in the open can contribute to, of course, including us. We also internally maybe want to have some nice little add-ons. So we came up with an idea where, where would these add-ons, how we call them, live? So we came up with some places that we think they would fit in well. So for example, in the header, let's say, very simple thing, we just want to say, when was this page last updated? which might indicate already, is it up to date? Or is it like 10 years old? Then probably it should be updated. Um, or we have the little search and it's like a perfect toolbar for like little, you know, text size or anything, little like settings you want to have there. Or on the left and the right, now you want to have some add-ons that are not really the content, but they relate to the content. So yeah, for example, if we have, if we show the like related pages or if we show uh, issues from the, from the repository was linked. Maybe that's a good way to, to put it there. And of course, in the content, if you want to embed something, or we just want to have a component that is just more than Markdown can by itself, then we can have it there. Because Markdown is simple, which is good, but in some cases, it might be too simple. So that's one way to build anything you want. It's a red component, and you have any possibilities with that. So that's the framework by itself. Now, let's take a step back. So there's different angles to look from um, because the framework, of course, at the end of the day, it's some code, right? But it's also a big change in the product. So as a documentation writer and reader, we might have new building blocks that we can incorporate in the content, or um, we might present the content in a different way that might be you know, more reader friendly or more enhanced, like a lot more content. Um, for adopters of Backstage, of course, this is, says, okay, at our company, we have this very specific thing or this very important thing. TechDocs doesn't have it, but we can create an add-on or look in the open for one existing one and we can use it. So that's, we can configure them, we can have them you know, sort them like how we want. And of course, as TechDocs developers, we internally started to expand TechDocs. We added more features here and there. But it kept growing organically. And at some point, it was just very big with many moving parts. And at some point, things break. You don't really know why. So our goal was to also have it architecturally clean, that we reduce everything just to the core. And everything that is not core experience is an add-on. So you just like hook it on top. And that's how we can have a clean architecture also going forward that you know, we don't know what people will build or people want to solve. But we know that we have a solution for that. And that's a very simple example how it would look like. It, the API is uh, coming up soon in a blog post where we announce this officially. It's not 100% resolved yet, but there's PRs that are being merged right now. And I think the last one will be in the next couple of weeks. So first you would just write a component how you would expect it. Anything rigged can connect to any backends, anything that you do in other base as well. 
you would configure it, which means that you specify a certain location. So I want this to be in the header or in the content or on the site what's our, and give it a name. But still, it doesn't mean that it's displayed yet because we want to separate the configuration from actually enabling it. So the way we do it is that we hook into the routes where we can specify this little element of add-ons where we just insert add-ons. And then by the configuration, they will know where to be displayed, which means that also in the entity page, you could have different add-ons than on the full docs page. So that's one reason why we do this and have some props if you want to configure them. Um, yeah, pretty much that's uh, coming up soon in blog post, more concrete to read as well. But also a bit about like the history, how we started that and why we started that. So as I mentioned, we have been growing Texas internally quite a lot. That was, I mean, yeah, over the last years since that talks existed actually. Um, but we realized, okay, we see common patterns. Like we have to come up, take a step back, look for our design. So in September, we collected some findings and we came up with a proof concept internally that was running in October and November. And we saw, yeah, it's actually, we can connect so many ideas with it. And then we just captured in an RFC more formally. Okay, this is something we want to support. This is something we believe in that can solve many problems in the future. And we iterated a bit internally and then released it in the public in February. Um, and since then, have been talking about it a little bit. And currently, yeah, we are wrapping up the implementation of the framework plus one example add on on top, which is what I mentioned, like to report an issue. So you could like select something and then suddenly a little thing pops up and you click on it and you land to a repository with a pre filled body and something. So that's can help like your documentation to um, stay up to date. Um, yes. That is pretty much actually already it. Um, it's a very short presentation because I actually want to encourage if there's any questions or any ideas or anything that you have always been wondering, um, pretty much like write them in the chat and I'm happy to answer them. That's it. I'll wait for anyone else to open their mic and, and ask because I have a couple of thoughts in my mind. Let me start. Um, so thank you, Otto. Um, this looks really great. Uh, the couple of um, types of add-ons you talked about, like report an issue or something in the header, I think um, that's something at which people were asking for a lot. So really good that it's here. I was just thinking that um, if, if we had any thoughts around um, how TikTok's add-ons relate with MKDocs plugins, because TikTok's is built on top of MKDocs and that has its own community of plugins for like adding a code blog and whatnot. So whenever let's say a TikToks adopter wants to add a new functionality, do you recommend adding it as an MKDocs plugin or do you think TikToks add-ons is the way to go? That's actually one of the, the biggest and hardest question we had to work with because in the beginning we realized we are very much invested into the Python ecosystem with MKDocs. However, everything else is in JavaScript and TypeScript and Reg world. So <clears throat> we realized, okay, we can leverage some existing MKDocs plugins that maybe suit our needs. But because the only thing we do, we use MKDocs to transform our markdown to HTML, but we don't really fully use MKDocs. So we're actually currently working on extracting MKDocs just as one like generator of markdown to HTML and trying to distance from it. So the idea is that if you find an MDX plugin that does work. We cannot 100% support that it might work. You can try it out. But the path forward we're going is definitely to integrate with add-ons that are independent of where it is generated. So that's the path forward. For and also staying in the right ecosystem. It's just more easier with types and staying in the same world, basically. That's a really good answer, actually. Um, you, you already built for backstage, so you probably are closer to JavaScript and might want to right JavaScript um, to do that. Thank you, yeah. Thank you too. Can I, can I ask a question? Go ahead, Francesco. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Otto, great presentation. Uh, you, you, you make me think about one, one question that I received a couple of hours ago from uh, 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 an adopter. 
uh, of course, I'm, I'm not going to share the name, uh, but they were interested to consider the option to add some kind of uh, RBAC capabilities, but let me say permissions capability to the tech docs. Do you think that this is something that where add-ons can play a role or not really? So, or at least uh, what, what could be a thought uh, on, on this topic? Hopefully someone uh, from the <laughs> from the team that I met uh, a few hours ago will listen to this or the recording. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, yeah, good question. So the way I see right now, add-ons mainly work on the front end. So we could prevent a page from being, being displayed, but the back end would still serve it. So for authorization, that might not be the best fit, but we're planning to get some input if we maybe extend add-ons to a backend counterpart. But right now it might be better solved if it is yeah, using the backstage, I mean, trying to work something in backstage itself and then using TechDocs as it is, because I think having auth authorization in TechDocs only might be not the best place, I think. Um, yeah, for many reasons, because like it might connect to search and it might connect to other things. And if it's really supposed to be not visible, it might be too late at that point. I wonder um, if if users have uh, an existing permissions framework set up, then, and Tim Vincenzo and other folks who worked closely with permissions framework, please correct me, but TechDocs would follow it, right? Um, isn't, that, isn't that correct? It would follow it for an entire site for the whole mm. component, I believe, but for sub pages, maybe not. Yeah, maybe there's one place where an add-on could serve as a, middle solution to sort that out right yeah that's i think that's correct yeah for individual pages um that's too detailed uh to um specific thing to hide yeah last thing on my mind was uh the the sheer um similarity between the tech docs add-on framework the boxes you shown showed and the entity page itself how you can basically reorder the entity page according to your own liking and put cards here and there. Um, it almost seems like uh, it must be like lots, lot of work uh, to make this, like enable this because I know entity page is quite complex. Um, so yeah, uh, do you, yeah, I was just thinking about it. There's no question uh, in there, like just appreciating like the effort uh, that goes into making this happen. Maybe just one small addition is that even if there's more things you want to extend, there's always the possibility to provide your own TechDocs reader page and even go crazy and do anything you want. But we try to figure out to cover the most cases that you can just like very easily plug in without knowing anything about the, the whole page. Well, um, thank you, Otto. It was really nice to talk to you and thank you for letting us know about TikTok's Adam framework. See you around. Um, next up, I believe it's uh, the front side team, but let me do a last uh, call to Carl Hayworth from uh, American Airlines. Are you around? Looks like uh, a no. So I'll hand it over to Taras and Charles from the front side team. Thank you. Thank you, Manchi. Um, hello, everybody. We're really excited to show you uh, the work that Charles and I've been working on. Um, it's uh, this is actually like a third iteration of this. We've done we've done a, we've done a big GraphQL deployment for one of our clients for Backstage, and so what we're doing now is uh, getting ready to open source that work as um as a as a um as something that you can install as a plugin uh, it's not available uh, it's not distributable yet because we're still kind of experimenting but i wanted what i wanted to do is uh show you what we have uh show you some of the benefits of graphql and then uh show you something kind of share so share what we know about the functionality that it provides um and then 
get the ball rolling on, on you know where we can have conversations about GraphQL specifically and you know start planning of what it would look like to have make this available more broadly. So for those who are not familiar with GraphQL, um, I'll say that uh, the uh, and you can see you can yeah I can see Charles' screen. So uh, the benefit of GraphQL is that it allows you to uh, it allows the client um, of this of the API to control what data is returned, and so um, it gives uh, the client a lot of control over uh, everything that it needs to get the data. That it, that, that, so what Charles is, uh, has on, on the screen right now is a uh, this is GraphQL. It's a it's a tool for qu for querying uh, GraphQL servers. And so what you see on the left side is a query that um, in, in, in this query, what we're doing is we're uh, going to retrieve an entity um, that is a, a domain um, with name artist. So uh, when we query it, uh, we get the data. So what we could do from here, we can, we can add to, we can add, uh, you know, we could uh, query additional information. So we could, for example, get the name of the uh, entity and we can get uh, uh, documentation. And every time that we, uh, if there's a description, uh, so every time that we um, add a field, we just you know submit the query and we get the data. So this By the is, way, is this, a uh, is the font sizes okay for everybody? Okay. Let's okay. See. Maybe a couple of um, zooms. Yeah, looking better. So, um, but so there. And so what happens here is every time that we add a field, it gets included in the in the one request. But you can actually uh, you can include any information that is exposed that is uh, supported by the schema that GraphQL server exposes. So what we could do is we could actually look at the schema. So Charles, why don't we pop open the um, the the docs tab? So GraphQL is self-documenting. So uh, if you want to make anything available through the API, you have to first define a schema, and then the schema is going to control what, what you can query in, in the server. And so what we're looking at here is we have a very minimal schema that um, there are two, two queries. One is um, node and entity. Um, node allows us to, node is a convention. We'll talk about this later, but uh, what essentially what the entity does is it, it allows us to query by passing different arguments. So if you go into entity, um, entity is a, what's called an interface. Um, so there are different types that implement the entity interface. And so this is so what we what we're working with here is a data model that already exists in the backstage catalog. We're essentially exposing it through a GraphQL API. Um, and so what we're going to look at here is if we go to domain. Uh, the domain is going to show us. So these are all the fields that are uh, that are available on the domain uh, data type. So now we can do is we can query. So for example, we can get the owner. Um, so yeah, on the main. So because it's a, uh, we need to specify the interface that we're going to be retrieving data from using. So in this case, it's domain or the type. Yeah. So now, now we're um, this is uh, this is domain. So let's get. We already have the name description. Let's get the owner. So owner um, owner can be a user or a group. So what we'll do is we'll let's get the the name of the of the uh, The name of the owner, yeah. So, so in this case, so so artist domain is owned by uh, Team A, um, and let's look at the so let, let's look at the actual owner um, in in our documentation so we could see what information is available for the owner uh, in the docs. Yeah, there we go. So it's user, and then so let's go to group. Uh, so it has all these fields. Okay, so let's let's get a let's get can we get members? On, on group. Uh, and then let's get the, the yeah, member names. There we go. So now, um, so now what we got here is we got uh, with a single query, we're getting the domain. We got the, um, we got the, uh, the owner of that specific dom uh, domain. And then we got the members of the group uh, who are, in this, like who own this domain. So now um, let's go back. So, so, so this is an example of like being able to kind of traverse into, into the graph. So what we're doing is we're essentially uh, specifying exactly what data we want to retrieve. Let's look at the, let's go back to our um, domain, the, the definition for domain. 
and let's look at this let's let's look at the systems so systems are the they are um field under domain so we could look at so let's retrieve retrieve our systems and so yeah let's get the name um and um so systems can have so let's expand the systems and so this is so what we're what what we're showing here essentially is the the uh, the way that you learn about uh, about the schema that's available and then uh, and then once you know what you what you have you can then start to think about like what do you want to expose so uh, so one of the things you could see like under systems we also have uh, uh, resources so let's let's show our uh, is it resources or Oh, actually, sorry. Let's show the components. There's so, both. Yeah, let's, let's do the components first. Oops. Okay. Name, and then yeah. So so for for our systems here, we have our um, so under system the uh, the. Artist domain. We have the the artist engagement system that has a lookup component in the in the and the www artist component. Um, and so now uh, we can look into. Uh, uh, let's look at the um, uh, resources that uh, for for the for these components. Uh, can we put the resources under the uh, under the components? individual Peter components Bowman. instead of the system? Yeah, because so we can get the resources for each individual component. Oh, I see. Yeah. Does this have a resources? I don't think it, it has a dependencies. Uh, dependencies. Okay, dependencies. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what we're getting here is for our um, for our artist lookup uh, component. Um, one of the dependencies is the artist database. So now what, what you could see, so what, one thing that's really interesting about this um, about this kind of traversing of the graph through GraphQL queries is that you're you're really kind of navigating the graph that is stored within the backstage uh, catalog. But what, what GraphQL does, it actually makes really clear what that graph is. Um, and what we could do is, so Charles, let's show the, um, let's show the the schema that we have implemented so far let's show that as an entity diagram so so folks can see what the um what the the uh, what those existing relationships look like we can use that as a starting point so so this is the, the schema that we've defined so far and so this is what we're, what we're using here is a tool called um, graphql voyager which allows us to uh, it creates a an entity diagram uh, from the from the GraphQL schema. So what we're looking at here. So we looked at we we talked about the entity interface. So the entity interface is um, implemented by all of these different types. And so what we could do, for example, we could like you know we could drop uh, we can click on for example resource, and then we can uh, you can see that the the um, we can see a resource, and resource has a dependence a dependencies property and it has a relationship to a dependency um, which is which is an interface that that is oh sorry a union of component and resource so these are um kind of what i'm describing here are building blocks and for for a lot of people this is going to be new things if you haven't worked with graphql this is going to be new to you so there's going to be there's a lot to learn about how to define a schemas um but I think with this, the like with the work that we're doing right now with the catalog schema is could be kind of a, a starting point to to set the the pattern uh, and and to visualize those relationships, and then once we, and with this base we can then like extend this base to add additional um, additional schemas. So before we start looking at expanding what we already have, are there any questions? Um, Are there any questions in the, the, the nope? So far question. nothing. Yeah. Uh, first of all, this is super cool. And we we have GraphQL for backstage internally at Spotify through kind of a, 
a separate mechanism. So it's really nice to see this in the open source. But one thing I was wondering about is uh, extension, like you can create new kinds in Backstage uh, specific to your company. So have you thought about how to support extension of the schema in that regard? Absolutely. Yeah. So let's, 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 we should let's jump right into that segue. Yeah. Let's, let's go into that. So, um, so let's say, uh, so there, so there are two types of things that you can extend, ex extend with GraphQL. One of them, uh, is, uh, you can add fields to types, I mean, to existing types and you can add, uh, new types and then you can, you can then express relationships between types to just this display kind of the graph. So Charles, why don't we start with, um, so I think what we want to do is, so, so we have this, uh, we have a, a resource um, that the, the RSDB resource. So let's say what we wanted to do is we wanted to, um, let's say we had like additional information in, in the YAML file. Like let's show the YAML file for the, um, the RSDB resource. You want to the example, okay. the, yeah. the example resource that we created. Should we look at this as, should we look at just how you define? Uh, well, okay. All right. Let's, let's just uh, look at the, the YAML file first. So we, what we're going to okay. do is we're, so we're going to extend, so we, we extended the, um, the extended, we, we essentially created a RSDB uh, res, uh, entity that has this additional spec, so protocol and host. And so what we want to do is we want to expand, uh, add this functionality to what we already have. So let's first of all, before we before we get into this, let's let's look at the. Uh, so like we want to make this information available through the GraphQL API. So let's before we do that, let's look at the like how the system like how how the GraphQL the existing GraphQL server is set up, and then we can we can talk about like how to extend it. So um, so this is uh this is not the uh, so the, the things to see here is that a GraphQL server um is consists of a bunch of modules. So right now, uh, as we've been, uh, these modules that we have defined here, they are just, this is not the final result. What we're gonna do is we're gonna bundle all of these into a single catalog, um, catalog module. And this catalog module is going to represent essentially a, a, um, a module um, that exposes schema um, for the core catalog. Um, and, we can to these modules we can add our own like we can st extend schema ourselves so we can add additional uh, functionality or we can add other modules so I, I can imagine in the future what we'll have is we'll have like the catalog is going to have its core a core schema um we could have a core schema for the tech docs you know which would would, would allow us to like see the existing document or query the existing documentation or um uh for scaffolder we could have a, uh, a module that uh, will include like a mutation that would allow us to like trigger scaffolding through the through graphql api mm -hmm. so essentially the functionality that that is exposed through the ui um we could we can make that functionality available both for querying and for mutating as a as a module for that particular component and then folks can create will be able to create their own um, modules as well um, yeah. And that's what we're going to show now. Right. I think the key thing is that it's 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 built by a collection of modules, uh, and so accepting third party modules is 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 not difficult. So it, it, it's yeah, it's built. It's it's a, it's already like we already have all the building blocks for this. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're using a tool called um, Envelop, uh, which is a uh, which is provides a lot of mechanisms for for um creating graphql servers from for modules so here's a so this is what a um what a resource type looks like um there's a couple of things here that are um that you might find that i think are really interesting um this is based on what we've learned from having done this a bunch of times so what you would see here on line 14 is this this is called a uh, directive so what we're doing here is we have essentially a uh, an owner owner is defined owner field refers to the owner type and the, the relation directive describes where um, like how to like um, it looks essentially what it allows us to do is it allows us to implement the the 
the resolution mechanism for that field without writing any JavaScript code. So with the relation, you, just, you specify the relation in directive, you say, what is the relation that you, the, the, the name of the relation, and then uh, that automatically gets converted into resolver, and then we, we, we retrieve the data for this. So, um, Charles, do you want to say anything about this before? No, before I think that's that's a good summary. Um, and so, and we have a similar uh, similar mechanism for for retrieving uh, information. So there's a field uh, directive mm -hmm. that we can use to to read data from from um, an entity. So what we yeah. can do here is we can create uh, we're going to create a, a new module. So module is a GraphQL schema file and a TypeScript file that um, that is used to um, that's used to essentially convert the GraphQL file into um, into JavaScript code. Um, so what Charles has done here is he's extended the resource type and he added the host property um, and said it's going to be a string and we're going to retrieve a value for that string from field located at, uh, at spec.host. Um, and so now having written this resource and do you have this resource, do you have this module registered in your, yeah, you need to uncomment yeah, that. Yeah, I need to register the module. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Okay, so no, now be able to under see. resource. We call and post. There we go. So now the data is available through the GraphQL through the GraphQL API. Um, and so something similar uh, we could do with with defining types. Like it, it takes a little bit of more work. To, to demo, but we could essentially also define custom types um, and then define custom yeah. relationships using the relationship. I mean, right now, there's there's all these types are defined using that same mechanism. So one way to think of it is we're, you know, this core catalog module is, you know, we're, we're dynamically adding types to the schema. Um, So the, you you can use you know you can define you can define any types inside your models. You just you don't just have to extend types that already exist. Charles, we could do we could do like a just to show as an example, right? So let's do like um let's do two resources. Let's say we have resources deployed to different environments. So let's have mm -hmm. a type called environment, um, and then it's gonna have let's just give it like a name. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Is this gonna be an entity? Um, we're not going to actually query it from the database because that's going to take a bit of time to set up. Yeah. What I want to show is I just want to show that uh, we can define the, uh, this environment. It's going to have, let's just give it a name. It's going to be a string. Okay. And then, um, and then let's add to the, to the resource. We're going to add a environments, which is going to be a pro field environments. And it's just going to be an array of, uh, environment. Oh, sorry. Uh, environment. Yeah, environment. So now if we, um, and we can do a reverse relationship on the environment. So let's say, uh, let's not do the implementation right now because we're not gonna actually query it um, because we don't have any relationships actually stored. But if we had the relationship, we will be able, would be able to show this. But in the environment, mm -hmm. let's, show, let's add the uh, reverse relationship to resources. Like that? Yeah, resources. And then it's gonna be a resource, a array of resource. Can we generate the schema for this and then drop it into into the uh, uh, GraphQL Voyager so we could show like sure. what the actual um, get the uh, can you show the schema uh, once we're done with this let's just show the schema the, the resulting schema in the in the code but we could let, let's first show it in the in the NC visualizer yeah in the Voyager. So now we have here is so on resource we should have um, resource should have environments and then the environment 
uh, has Rebecca relationships to resources. So this is the, so this is, so we're now creating types. And so if we had the actual resources, we had the data in our database, we would be able to then map it with a, um, with a, with a relationship. Uh, relationship. Yeah. yeah. Let's add that relationship now just to show kind of what that would look like. Uh, so this would be like, uh something like that yeah something like that yeah and then same thing for for on resource we need to have i think uh, uh i would say just call the relationship environments that, that it, 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 yeah it really it's actually we default we actually use the field name so if your relationship okay. type is the same as the field name we can just do that you need to right okay so that would be, and so now, now that now uh, now with the resolution would handle like it will handle retrieving the data, and the, the only thing you need to do is just make sure that you have those relationships represented in, in the database. So this is the kind of starting point. Like what, what we've described essentially is a um, kind of the building blocks that I think we could use to uh, create an extensible GraphQL um, server for Backstage. Um, I think there's still a lot of work. To, like, there's a lot of there's a lot of work to do still in. Um, but we have a really good starting point. Um, so, questions, comments. Just a comment that this was a really cool demo, and thanks for doing live coding again, Charles, uh, on your favorite Emacs. So let's get to see that. Um, I had one thought. Um, I see that there's an existing GraphQL plugin in the backstage repository, and I wonder, like, um, did you make use of it, or do you think it's um, doing a different purpose? I'm not super familiar with it. Um, so, do you have any thoughts on that? I yeah. I mean, I think that that plugin um, that plugin it was a good starting point, like for early experimentations. But it's not. It it doesn't have the a lot of the pieces that we showed, I think there there is a very specific way that you want to create a schema so that you can you can create this composable graph, like you can traverse these relationships. Um, it the schema design that's in the existing GraphQL plugin is not really it, it's not really like designed for that kind of uh, that kind of um, ex expressibility ex expression of uh, of queries. So I think what we could, we could do is replace that plugin with a new version that has all the things that we want which will have like extensibility it will have a lot of the the things that we want to have long term for backstage does that make sense yeah yeah i mean it's i don't think it's been updated for a very long time as well um so i would i would imagine that yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we need to like. We didn't talk about this. We didn't talk about this because there. But there are um, what we don't have right now is we need to have. We need to introduce um, relay. Uh, there, there are um, there are like there's a relay spec which is a uh, which is a which is a kind of a convention for writing uh, GraphQL schemas, um, and one of those conventions is is this node query which allows us to. Um, which allows us to essentially re retrieve any kind, any any element in the in the database uh, by ID, um, and this is a building block for a lot of like caching and um, and uh, and infinite scroll type UI uh, implementations. So there's still a lot of stuff that we need to like we we didn't talk about this, but there's uh, there are things that we still need to just need to kind of introduce to the community and um, we're going to need to kind of write a blog, long blog post that explains a lot of these things uh, but there's it gives us some really good kind of building blocks for doing that um, well what I wanted to propose is that uh, I'd like to create a, a, a discord channel for the GraphQL work so we can start to have we can start doing releases of what we have now and start to talk to people about um, what else needs to be added to it. And we can discuss the GraphQL plugin in that channel. What do you folks think about that?
I guess I'll just leave that works question. With, yeah, it works with me. I think uh, a question for the Discord general channel, I guess. Um, yeah. And then um, we can create one. Um, how do, and my last question, how do people reach out um, to you about this? Do you think there's a, there's an RFC open where you need some input or do you think, um, yeah, this new channel is, will be the place or how, how can people keep up to date with the, with the work? I think the channel would be a good place to start. Um, there is I, one now. Uh, oh, GraphQL for GraphQL? <laughs> yeah, Patrick, I guess just oh, created one. I just created one, okay. Cool. Uh, so I think that the GraphQL channel is going to be a good place to start. Um, and then, uh, because I, I don't like, there is, there are too many things to jam into a single RFC. So I think that, I think we might want to do it in stages. So I would love to get some guidance on, on how we can, um, how we can do this. I think for now, we're going to uh, just do for this kind of early iterations. We're going to keep this in, in our uh, backstage uh, repo in, uh, in our front side uh, org, but then we can transfer that project when you know whenever. Like I, I just, I, I just, I think it just needs needs some um, some help in figuring out like how we would actually bring this to to the core. Um, and um, we're open to any suggestions, uh, but it's just there's a, I, I just don't know what procedure is, you know, um, or how we how we go about doing this. But we, we can talk about it in the, in, in the Discord yeah. channel. So it, thank you again, Charles, uh, Tara, and Charles, and Sierra. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Right. Thank you, everybody. That uh, takes us to the end of the session. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, we are going to be on KubeCon uh, next month in Valencia, Spain. So if you're going uh, to KubeCon Europe, um, you'll find some folks from the Backstage Core team at Spotify. And yeah, join us. And um, there's going to be a project meeting, which, um, which could be interesting for you. Um, yeah, and we have uh, a new community hub on backstage.io slash community, where you can check out all things that are happening, uh, these sessions included. That's it for today. And see you around uh, in the next community session, which will be three weeks from now. Have a good day. Bye.